All right, uh, up next, we have our second to last presentation uh, by Cassandra Perch, which is going to talk about interaction interfaces. Interaction interfaces are ways that we can work with uh, and provide input into computer systems. Uh, this is actually not just something limited to the makerspace, but also the acoustic sounding... Are we going to leave the music on? Yeah, but make sure you turn off your mute. You're on mute. Um, the, the, the way that we can provide input into the system. Uh, this is not necessarily limited to just maker movement and stuff of that nature. I interaction interfaces is actually a sort of a broader computer science discipline. So it's a really amazing world. There's a lot of a wonderful things going on in it. Now I'd like to hand it over to Cassandra to tell us a little bit about it. Hi. So um, like you said, I'm going to cover input. I'm also going to cover output a little bit because um, basically we, we interact with our robots just as much as they interact with us. So um, definitely going to talk about that as well. So a little about me, I am an, a fun employed node botanist. I, um, yeah, I'm a JavaScript addict and I'm a GIF connoisseur. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about a robot for a second, like think about what, what you see as a robot just for a second. And then I want you to toss that out the door because a lot of people when they think of robotics, they strictly think of the, the Arduinos, the LEDs, the sensors, the, the things that you would think about when you go to a shopping site like SparkFun, like Adafruit. And there's so much more to this. And, it's, and when I kind of realized that it kind of like, whoa, I can do all these things with everyday items and everyday electronics that not, you wouldn't necessarily think about from a perspective of robotics. So when you look at any electronic, not just something that, like a robotics, but any electronic, think to yourself, does this connect to the internet? Does it have an API? And can I access sensor data from this? Even if just one of the, one of the questions is answered with yes, you can probably use this with your robots in a way that you may not have thought of previously. A really great example of this is um, the Firefox operating system. So, Firefox operating system is, is on phones that are touchscreen phones. They're, they're cheap to make, they're cheap to purchase, and they're not very powerful. So a lot of people didn't, they just said, oh, that's cool for developing countries that want to replace feature phones with smartphones. When I got a hold of it, I thought, wow, this is a $70 touchscreen with an accelerometer, a speaker, a camera, and all of these things that I can use with my robotics. Oh, and it uses the web tech that I already use every day. Writing a Firefox OS application is writing a web page with one extra file, a manifest that's a JSON file that just tells the phone what to load and how to load it, kind of like a package.json file for a node application. So when you look at Firefox OS as that, you see uh, you, this whole realm of opportunity opens up to interact with your robotics. My Firefox phone actually holds like five or six applications that I can show you all at my table that interact with my robotics via WebSockets. And sometimes the phone provides input to the system. Sometimes the phone is an output device for the system. Um, I can see sensor data in text or like graph format on the phone when ne not necessarily I could do that through the, uh, the robot itself. And I reacted much like that kitten when I found out what was going on with Firefox OS and connected it to my first Arduino project. I was very, very happy to see that, oh wow, this thing that maybe wasn't necessarily applied for robotics can be moved really quickly over. Another example is the pebble you got in your, your um, goodie bag because what, is, what it is is it's a smartwatch that interacts with your phone, but when you think about it, because they have an SDK in C and an SDK in JavaScript, you now have a wrist-mounted remote for all of your IoT devices. And again, you have that extra output. You can see what's going on on the Pebble screen. You can write an application in those languages that can interact with the robotics. And there's four different buttons on that thing. So like, if you're thinking about a simple robot that you want to go back, forth, turn, you, know, you could find a way to make that interaction work for you. Uh, another example that's been around for a while is game controllers. So like an Xbox controller, or I have here a PS3 controller and a Wiimote. Um, 
Usually we think of those as just peripherals for the gaming devices they come with, but because languages have taken such an interest in hardware, a lot of languages have libraries for these and you can now use, and again, not just as a direct control system, but there are sensors in a lot of these controllers nowadays, especially the newer ones, that you can use as, uh, just as a sensor. You don't necessarily need to use the controller function of the actual gaming controller. The Wiimote, for instance, the Nunchuck has a very, very nice, very accurate accelerometer in it that you can't really get a hold of otherwise. Um, I mean, you can, but it's a little more expensive than the generics, and it's really nice to use, and it's got a good form factor for hand movement. But direct input's cool, but it, it's not everything. It, it's a lot of things, and, it, and in you, a lot of robotics projects use only direct input. But when I think about what goes into a robot and what, cre what makes it work, I don't just think about direct input because the internet is an amazing thing. There, are, there is in, almost an infinite amount of data available to us on the internet and visualizing that and displaying it with hardware in a 3D space, in a real space, is something that's really interesting. And there are really great places to go online to get data or to send data around in ways you may not have thought of previously. For instance, Twilio, you can text message just about anything. You can send text messages, receive them. You can send phone calls, receive phone calls. You can do basically anything with telephony uh, online, you can do a Twilio. With Twitter, you can get masses of information really quickly. You can search for a hashtag, you can see what's trending, you can see what your friends are up to. You can, uh, you know, you, you can access lots of different uh, information. Facebook, all right, their API is a little hard to use, but once you get a hold of it, that's again, is a plethora of information that you could display in a way that wouldn't require direct input. And as for APIs for data, open government is, a, is an initiative that's really been taking hold. It's not really a centralized thing. It's just this idea that local governments should make their data available to everybody. And so a lot of local governments in the US have, have made their data online in JSON format. So you could create a robot that doesn't react to direct input, but reacts to, say, uh, the weather in a specific area or, um, or traffic in a specific area, or even, you know, you could, you could really do some interesting things with that data and visualization. But um, think about the ways you can aggregate local and worldwide data instead of just using direct input when looking at outputting things in hardware in real space. Some examples, um, at, the, at a, a place I used to work at, we had a build system that when the build failed, instead, of, well, it would also send everybody an email, but it would light up around the office little red status LEDs to say, oh, by the way, the build's broken. And it was a very instantaneous way to spot, oh, look, the build's broken, we need to go get it. Instead of waiting till our email flipped over another time, we would have an instant way of recognizing, hey, the build, something's going wrong with the build. Um, I've seen someone implement text messaging their Christmas tree to change the light color. So um, I actually have something similar. It's, uh, I put up the prototype the other day. I live in an apartment complex where my patio faces the street and they had a decorating contest, so I put LEDs on the railing of my porch and I put a URL. And if you went to the URL, you could input a color and it would change the color of the lights to that. Yeah, they informed me that I'm winning. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I have to re-put the, the prototype back up now that I've waterproofed it, but anyway. Um, for instance, these shoes that I'm wearing, they're pulsing white right now. When anybody favorites something on my Twitter feed, they flash gold for a few seconds. Um, those are the kinds of ways you can aggregate massive amounts of data, or not so massive, but still from a different source, and create an interesting um, interaction between you and a robotics or someone else in robotics. And the last one is a desk sign that you can email to say, oh, I'm in a meeting, or I'm at lunch, or whatever. You know, you can have a le little electronic desk sign that tells people where you are. So when we think about output, in a lot of ways, uh, people think of moving robotics, so motion would be their output. Some people think of, of text as an output. There are lots of different ways we can show data with robotics. Uh, text, color, movement, sound, and tactile are the, first, are the, are the ones that pop into mind pretty quickly. Um, and and they're, they're all, they can all be used in ways that are really, really interesting. So don't just think about how you want to interact with your robot, think about how you want your robot to interact with you. Um, a lot of people think, oh, well, I'll just put text. Okay, is there a cool way you can show that with color, or is there a cool way you can show that with multiple LEDs, that like, if these light up, you know it's one thing, if these light up, it's another. Or how about sound or tactile? They have little vibration motors, you can use tactile, you can feel your robot interacting with you. Movement, yes, you can have a robot walk, but what if you have like a clock style, like where it moves to a specific angle for a specific status? Um, this really quickly gets into uh, art in robotics, and 
it's, it, I find it very, very interesting because a lot of people that I know that are in robotics are like, well, I'm not an artist, but I assembled this sculpture that only I know what it does in a specific status because it moves to a specific way. I'm like, that's art. You know that, right? Like, the robots and art are so close together naturally that a lot of people tend to miss it, but I, I find a specific artistic elegance in a hexapod walking down a table or in a color, like a color panel. I, I personally am obsessed with those little individually addressable RGB LEDs. Like, those are my favorite thing ever. And I love to be able to show information in new ways using them. So, wow, I'm way early. So, if you have a cool idea for an interface, you may be asking, like, what now? Do I just build it and that's it? No, 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 no. You want to document your build. Open source your code. Yes, please, we want to see your prototype. We don't care if your code was written overnight on a caffeine you know, binge and it's not commented. We still want to see it. We still want to see what you've come up with and we want to help. Document what went wrong just as much as you've documented what went right. I know it sounds kind of an uh, antithesis, like if you write a blog post, you want to sell how well your project went. But on the other hand, people learn so much better from your mistakes than from your successes. It's one thing to read about someone's success. It's another thing entirely to be like, oh, I should avoid that because that will end catastrophically. And then share it with the world. Um, for instance, if you're into JavaScript robotics, forums.nodebots.io is a great place to go to share your new information. And uh, there's lots of communities for lots of different languages. And uh, I'm running really early, apparently. I talked too fast. But uh, I definitely have plenty of time for questions. And if you'd like to see demos, they're at my table. All of them are just big and hard to move around, so I left them at the table. Um, I am Node Botanist on Twitter and GitHub. And I'm in the corner of the hack hackerspace near the wearables with Christina. Um, our booths are both covered in RGB LEDs, so you'll probably spot us pretty quickly. <laughs>